before I get started, I just want to take a moment to thank all of those who've helped to plan and lead worship this morning. And as you have noticed, Mark Williams has stepped into a couple of extra roles this morning in Tim's absence. Thank you, Mark. And also thank you to the Dean family for lighting our Advent candles this day. Would you please pray with me? O oh, Holy One, you come to us in ways that are familiar and comforting at this time of year. And you also come to us in ways that are discomforting too. And so we pray that you would keep us open and receptive as you speak to us through your word for us this day. And oh, dear God, may the words that I have to offer here this morning please you and honor you and glorify your holy, holy name. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to begin this morning by asking all of you some questions. Now, this is not a quiz. Rather, it's just a way to begin to engage this challenging story from Matthew this morning. So here's my first question. When you are setting out on an unfamiliar journey to a new destination, how do you find your way? Or how many of you still use a traditional map in paper form, or maybe an atlas? Any of you? <laughs> I, I prefer those, but those are hard to come by these days. <laughs> or how many of you use a real-time web navigation device, like Google Maps or Bing Maps or Maps.me? <laughs> Anyone here? Yes? <laughs> My kids finally got me to use one a few years back. Or how many of you perhaps have a co-pilot or maybe a backseat driver <laughs> who is always willing to help navigate the way? <laughs> yes, I have one in my family too. <laughs> and how many of you just have a really good sense of direction and rarely need any assistance in finding your way. Anyone? <laughs> I see a couple folks raising their hands. <laughs> finding our way. Finding our way. This certainly has been a common theme in our lives and in recent times, hasn't it? I mean, all of us. Every single one of us all around this planet have been finding our way through these pandemic times during these past two years and nine months. And just recently, I heard some new language used, triple-demic. Triple-demic. Have any of you heard that language yet? In other words, we need to be concerned and cautious about the spread of COVID and RSV and influenza. We indeed are still finding our way. And here in these transitional times at First Church, through all the challenges and the losses, and the opportunities that come with times like these, while also tending to that wide range of feelings that we are all experiencing in response to these in-between times. We are finding our way. And at this time of year, Many among us are also finding our way through the crowds at the malls as we do our Christmas shopping, or perhaps finding our way through the stress of online shopping, anyone? <laughs> and as of this past Friday night, thanks to the University of Utah, our Buckeyes may have found their way into the college football playoff. 
Go Bucks. So, here we all are, seeking our way and finding our way through the ups and downs of our lives and within our life together. And in this very busy and often stressful time of year. Now, wouldn't it be comforting and reassuring if, on this second Sunday of Advent, we were to be met with words of Scripture that acknowledge our perseverance and our resolve in the midst of the stress and struggles of our lives? But no, instead, in our gospel reading from Matthew today, God confronts us and challenges us and maybe even discomforts us through God's word for us this day, which is a call for repentance. And as is often the case, God comes to us in unexpected ways, and often through the voice of those who are deemed the other. And so, in our text for this morning, God grabs the attention of the people who had gathered there in the wilderness of Judea through the compelling preaching of John the Baptist, this one who was a wanderer. He was an outcast. This one, according to both Matthew and Mark, wore clothes made of camel's hair and ate locusts with wild honey. John the Baptist was eccentric and very different from that crowd of people in just about every way. He didn't fit in. He was definitely an outsider. And yet, and yet, God still chose John the Baptist to go to the people, to meet the people exactly where they were and as they were in order to wake them up and to challenge them and to prepare them for the way that is for a new way. Now, the word Advent as you may recall, is derived from the Latin word adventus, or the biblical Greek word parousia, both of which literally mean a coming or a new beginning. And so here in this story, John the Baptist represents this bridge, if you will, between what has been and what is yet to be. He has one foot in the old age, which is coming to a close, and his other foot is in a time that is just being born. And so, in this story, John the Baptist, this prophet, represents a bridge between the eras of Israel's history. And the Gospel writer of Matthew makes that clear for us by quoting the ancient words of the prophet Isaiah, who wrote, the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So, here we are in this in-between time, this liminal space, if you will, with John the Baptist representing what has been, while he also points to what is yet to be. And again, the setting of this story is the wilderness, and that is significant because the biblical Greek word for wilderness is arenia which is often translated as a place of renewal and revelation. A place of renewal and revelation. Now, I don't know 
about you, but I do find that to be very reassuring. That these wilderness places of our lives and these transitional times along our journeys can be seen and experienced as a time of renewal and revelation and insight and a time to reset and reorient ourselves to a new way of being, if we are open to it. And how exactly do we do that? Well, John the Baptist certainly does not mince words. And according to Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, John appears in the wilderness while pro proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then again in verse 8, this time addressing the Sadducees and the Pharisees who had been coming for baptism, John the Baptist warned them when he said, Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Then he went on to tell the crowd in verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Repentance. Repentance. It's, it's a loaded word, isn't it? it? It's a concept that I think many of us probably associate with fire and brimstone kind of preaching. That type of preaching that relies on the depiction of eternal damnation as a persuasion to follow God's will. That type of perhaps shame and blame preaching that we don't often hear within the United Church of Christ very often. Thank goodness. However, however, the word repentance is derived from the biblical Greek word metanoia, which literally means to change one's mind or to turn around or to reorient oneself. A spiritual reorientation, if you will. And I find that to be a especially helpful and hopeful in this season of Advent during this time when we are called to prepare the way of the Lord. In all the busyness and the stress and the overscheduledness of these weeks leading up to Christmas, we can always count on John the Baptist this truth teller who doesn't mince words to remind us and confront us and implore us to look within and to examine our hearts as we prepare our whole selves for the birth of the Christ child within our hearts and in our lives once again. I'd like to close this morning with a brief prayer called Advent Prayer, and it's written by Joyce Rupp, who is an author, a speaker, a spiritual director, and the co-director of the Institute of Compassionate Presence. Let us pray. O Holy One, awaken our hearts, quiet our minds, Open the door of our beings to perceive your presence. Settle what stirs endlessly within us. Quiet the voice of haste and hurry. Awaken our inner senses to recognize your love hiding beneath the frenzy. Enfold us in your attentiveness. Wrap a mantle of mindfulness around every part of our day. We want to welcome you with joy and focus on your dwelling place within. Thanks be to God. Amen.